The book of Genesis chapter 8, starting in the 20th verse. The Bible says, And Noah builded an ark unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. One of the first things Noah did after God finally cleared him to exit the ark, and he spent what, what most theologians estimate to be about a year in there, close to about 370-some days, I believe, days and nights. We know the flood endured for 40 days and nights. But after he'd been in the ark for 300 and maybe 77 days or so, I believe it's that's what it's estimated, one of the first things Noah did after God finally cleared him to leave the ark and after he finally received si signification from God, he released those doves. One of the first things he did was he built an al altar. The one who built the ark by the word of the Lord, immediately upon coming out of the ark, built an altar unto the Lord. And upon building that altar, where he found the wood, I don't know, maybe he took that door that door of the ark and, and grabbed his hammer and a crowbar that was in there and pried off a few of those pieces of wood from the door of that ark and constructed an altar unto God. Or maybe God showed him a tree and he used one of the, an axe that he had on board of that ark. Either way, when he came off that ark, he constructed an altar unto God. And the Bible says he took of every clean beast, of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings unto the Lord. That means he sacrificed upon that altar that he built out of the ark animals unto God. And animal sacrifice, unfortunately, is very unfortunate that it has to happen, but it does have to happen. It used to happen for sin. We don't sacrifice animals anymore for sin. We sacrifice them now for our natural sustenance. That's what we do when we hunt and we slaughter. And I know some of you don't like that, but uh, the reality is that animal's gonna die either way. And either they'll lay in the woods and rot somewhere for the vultures to eat, or either God will accomplish a purpose out of their life for the furtherance and the strength of His highest creation, which is humanity. And God, in part, in his foreknowledge created the animal to be sacrificed for our sustenance and initially for our sin but since Christ the lamb was sacrificed for our sin you no longer have to sacrifice animals for sin now they're only sacrificed for our physical strength and it's unfortunate that that has to be the case but they're dying just like we are and like as we're all supposed to die for something they're, the purpose of their death their cross we all have a purpose from God for which we're dying their cross is our strength. And they, they are now sacrificed for our strength. But before Christ, they were sacrificed for sin to cover our sin. But they could not take away our sin. The blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. But coming out of that flood, what was poured out of the wrath of God for the iniquity of man, poured on the earth in the form of water, destroying every living thing. Noah, God put him in the ark, and he put him in the ark with two of each creature that God had chosen to save. I don't believe the dinosaurs or any of those others were chosen. God selected certain species, and just about all of them, and they went on that ark. But when that ark finally came to rest on Mount Ararat, I believe it was, God opened the door after he shut it. Noah built it an altar, and he took out of every creature that God had hid in that ark, and he sacrificed of them unto God. 
And the offering was so pleasing to God. The Bible says God smelled a sweet savor from heaven. It was so acceptable that God in His heart at that moment from the sacrifice made covenant with Noah. And He said, I'll no more curse the ground for your sake. And I will no more curse every living thing as I have cursed and then he said on top of that, while the earth remain in its seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. When I read this passage though of Noah sacrificing those animals to God, two things come to mind, two that I hope to talk to, about, to you about here for a little bit. And I'll try to keep this shorter. I'm sorry if you don't like lengthy videos. It's not my, my call. I just try to tarry until I feel like I've unloaded everything that God put in me. Take it or leave it. If you don't have time for it, turn on something else. Well, this will go until I feel like God says turn it off. But when I read that, the thing that confuses my reasoning, I guess you would say, not really confuses, but you know He only went on the ark with two of each. And why did God put them on the ark in the first place? To save them from extinction via water, the flood. So when you read of Noah, the first thing he does when he lays down the, the door of the ark is he takes of those that he only had two of and he kills them. He offers them to God. And to me, that, that doesn't make very much sense. That's contradictory. That like defeats the whole purpose of the ark to begin with. You had them on there to save them and the first thing you do when you get them off there, they survive the flood, is to kill them. Why did he do that? And did he did he waste the whole effort by giving it to God? What animals did he sacrifice? And how could he afford to sacrifice, given that he only had two of each. That can that can that can seem contradictory. That can seem like a mistake. It can seem like the sacrifice was a mistake to God. When you think about it though, like I said, he was in the ark for about a year, it's estimated. Three hundred and sixty five days. By the time they came off that ark, He's no longer dealing with two. He's dealing with Lord knows how many. In other words, in the span of time on that ark, you put a male and a female of certain types of animals, they'll go through, and within a year's time, they'll go through a season, a mating season, I believe is what many call it. And it happens pretty much annually. If, if they're still, if they're young enough to where they're, they still have that drive to procreate and stuff. But confined in, in stalls on the ark, however it was that God constructed it, I don't have on, on memory the, the very dimensions, but put a male and a female of each, each kind in their own stall for 360 some days alone. And in the course of time, nature's going to take its course. The birds and the bees were living up to their notorious phrase, so to speak. In other words, when he came, when, when a year had surpassed, and the ark finally settled, Noah was no longer dealing with two of each kind. Whether there had been multiple births, and when most animals give birth, they don't just give birth to one, but many do. But whether there had been multiple births, litters, whatever, when Noah gave sacrifice, he didn't give out of need, so to speak. Sure, he had little. But whether it was a, a kid, a kid that had been birthed in that year, Three months in, they, the the male and the female had initiated the process of procreation. Nine months later, however long it takes for an animal. 
a kid was born. And whether it was just a, a kid of, of a certain kind he took, or whether it was one of the adults he took, regardless of what it was, Noah had God provided the sacrifice. And you think about it, God, given that God had to prepare the ark for the sacrifice. Think about that. I said he might have used the wood from the ark. Think about God's wisdom that surrounds the sacrifice. God prepared those stalls for the, the litter and the children that might have been born through that process of time. There was extra room for the sacrifice. And then God prepared the mother's womb for the sacrifice. So if the male, if Noah took a male and sacrificed him unto God, the mother's womb had the, the future of the species in her. And shortly after Noah offered it unto God, God blessed her womb, which was already impregnated with the future of a species. Either way, when you think about the, the potential folly and the foolishness of Noah offering what limited he, he had of those creatures and how it looked like they were going to go extinct if he offered them to God. And how it looked like the, the most foolish thing he could do. Because he only had two. Either way, he had enough for the sacrifice. And when you read this, When you read this, the Bible says, because he sacrificed. It's like the widow. The widow gave the prophet. She said, I only have enough meal and I only have enough oil for one more meal for me and my child. We're going to eat it and die. And the prophet said, by the word of God, you give that to me. Give me, make me a cake. Make me a meal. And God will supernaturally Put flour in your cupboard and oil in your basin. Noah, it may have seemed that he did it out of necessity, or no, not out of necessity, but out of lack. But he sacrificed unto God, and because he did, God said, I'll no more curse the ground. So what, what that means, and then God said, the earth will endure to the end. What that means is, it seemed like the wrong, maybe the wrong thing to do according to our wisdom. If you kill one, well, there's so few, it might go extinct. What about the future of this planet? You just came through a year caring for those animals on board that ark, feeding them, watering them, cleaning up after them to save them, just to kill them for God? No, there was enough. While it seemed not to make sense, the sacrifice was the very thing that blessed the species and that blessed Noah and that blessed the heart of God. And by that sacrifice, God made a covenant with Noah with a rainbow. And he said, I'll keep this earth and I'll not curse it again for your sake. <clears throat> Just a few days ago, I saw a video, I believe Tommy Robinson shared it. Um, he's, he's a journalist out of the UK, a wonderful guy, a very brave man. Uh, it, was a, it was a video of a politician in an English-speaking country out east, and this politician was, had, was standing in water, and then he was submerged himself in water, in a body of water, in a video that he had, he had produced and that he had created to, to appeal to potential voters which we hope and pray elections matter anymore. I have no faith in them anymore, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't know everything about it, but I knew God warned me that they were going to be rigged, especially the 2020 election. But um, this politician, God save his soul, he took one clip of himself standing ankle deep in water, one clip of himself standing knee deep in water, and then he eventually was up to his neck in water. Look how he was treading. And the whole point of his video dealt with global warming. And he was basically saying, my God, the ice is going to melt. We're all going to drown. The ice is going to melt. The earth, the atmosphere, we're eroding it. We're going to kill ourselves. We're going to kill our children. 
blah, 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 blah. We need to do everything we can do to save creation, to save nature, to save the earth. Go green. Basically what he was saying. I'm not mocking him. I pray for him. I love him. But that was the point of this video. It was essentially global warming. And that's been a political thing that's been in, spoken of since I was a child. I believe Bill Clinton's vice president was perhaps the first to talk about it. I don't know that. I don't know much about the history of it. But the idea has been and is that we are essentially committing meteorological suicide. And if those are the wrong words, I apologize, but that's the essence of it. By the, by the technology we use and the way we use it, the pollution... The, the theory is we're harming the atmosphere, we're harming the, the soil, we're harming the air we breathe and all that. And there's no denying that you get around certain areas that, that pump out a lot of smog or whatever, you're going to probably get some asthma and you're going to have trouble breathing. I've experienced that myself. But the reality is, regardless of what they say, friend, this earth is not in trouble, the atmosphere is not in trouble, the soil is not in trouble. We don't have to change the cars we drive. <laughs> we should, I think, especially when you become so dependent on gas, gasoline. You see what that's doing to us. Learn to make something else. Get some Elon Musk in there. But the reality, global warming, if I could say it just simply to you, global warming is a lie. And I don't say that to offend anybody. I don't say that to anger you. I just say that because God said... While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. God said that. The Bible said the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God has given man dominion on earth, but the earth is God's property. Property of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you can make up, a, you can have a theory. It's a theory, but it's a lie. It's just as big of a lie as the theory of evolution, global warming. I love you, whoever you are who invented it, but it is a lie. There has not been evidence for it yet. There will not be again. The, gri the, the, the leaves, the trees have leaves on them again. The grass is green again. It's springtime again. And God said, while the earth remaineth, Seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. It's not going anywhere. And it's not, it doesn't matter. Do whatever you want. Dig a hole in the ground. Frack. <laughs> Go dig for oil. We'll never run out. Pump your pollution to the sky. It won't erode the atmosphere. It is held by the word of the Lord. And because God said it, I'm not, I know that's that's a touchy subject because some people are so passionately convinced that global warming is real. But it's not. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God promised Noah. Every time you see a rainbow in the sky, it says global warming's a lie. Because God said this earth is not going anywhere until I'm done with it because it stands on my word. And I agree if there's more economic ways that we can do things, That'll, that'll keep us healthy. That's smart. But don't worry about this earth. <laughs> First of all, it's not your eternal home. Unless you choose to live a life of sin and die in sin, it, it may be. Because hell is in the center of the earth. And those who die in sin never leave earth. But you're not staying on this side of earth either way. Secondly, it's not going anywhere. You have as many kids and grandkids as you want. There's enough room for her. There's enough natural resources. And the earth will not fail. Why? Because God said it won't. While it remains, seed time, harvest will remain. What we need to learn is not to clutch onto it. Look at what Noah did. Noah had the future of all planet earth in his boat. And only by two. But instead of being conservative, and I'm not using that word politically, I'm talking about sparing, about, about paranoia, fear of losing it all, clutching on to it. 
instead of being so whatever whatever you would call a Scrooge about it. He was liberal in the way that he spent it to God. And instead of holding it in and thinking, I've got to do something to save planet Earth, I've got to save these species. There's only two of them. There's only a few now. The mother may be pregnant, but there's so few. I can't, I can't spare any for God. Instead of doing that, the first thing he did was to offer sacrifice to God. Offer it to God. And it pleased God. And God, by that sacrifice, it may not seem to make sense to our natural mind, but by that sacrifice, God blessed the species and He blessed planet Earth. And they're still here today. Every one of them. The only ones that will go extinct are the ones that God wills that will go extinct. They're still here today because Noah would not spare them from the Father. They're God's property, aren't they? God created them, didn't they? This is His world, isn't it? He's given us dominion. We can do as we will. But He has said by His Word, the earth will not fail. What we need to realize is instead of trying so hard to save it, the way to save it, if you want to say it that way, we don't have to save it, but the way to see it blessed and prospered, if you want to harvest, if you want your, your livestock to, to prosper, if you want the, <laughs> the secretariat of all secretariats, if you want livestock to give birth to the greatest that they could, the secret's not in breeding, it's not in saving, it's not in going green, it's not in any of that. It's not in liberal policies. It's not in the Green New Deal. The secret is sacrifice unto God. Give it to God. We don't have to try to save what's His. Let Him take care of it. What we need to do is take care of our part and give it to Him. You're withholding from God. If you're storing it to yourself and thinking you've got to do something, you don't have to do anything. Look at the rainbow. Let God shine a rainbow over your sky to remind you that it's His planet and that His covenant will keep it. We make a mistake when we hoard it under ourselves and we think, I've got to keep it, I've got to do it, I've got to have it. No. Sacrifice it to God. That's where it's blessed. That's where it's prospered. Not only the earth, but... The Bible says present your bodies as a living sacrifice. We need to give ourselves unto God. We need to give our time, our talents, our gifts, everything back to the Father. The way that Noah was blessed to, to sort of transfer the object of this, this truth, call those Call those possessions of the ark Noah's gifts. It was all, I mean, it looked like it was all his. He was the only, him and his family, were they were the only living bodies on planet earth at that time. He owned it all. Besides Adam, he's the, the solo man, him and his sons and their wives, that ever could have said, you know, we own earth. Some are seeking that today, and what a mistake that is. They won't prosper. God forgive them. They won't prosper. Because it's in God's hands. The kingdoms may be in Satan's power to give, but the earth is the Lord's. He sets one up and takes down another. But every creature on that ark, if we could redirect this now to our gifts, consider now our gifts, not only our bodies, not only the earth, but our gifts. Every creature on that ark was a gift from God. And rather than hoarding it to himself and, and, and building fences and, and becoming as wealthy and prosperous as he could, Noah sacrificed those gifts from God back to God. And when he did, God blessed them. He could have built his own empire. He, and he did eventually, you know, create... create bounds for the some of those creatures 
that he needed to survive for milk and meat. But instead of that, Noah gave it to God. Noah gave it to God. Many years ago, um, when I was a senior in high school, I'm going to illustrate this through a gift God gave to me. It's not a not not, not a significant illustration, really. It's a, not the greatest gift in the world, but it is a gift that God gave to me. Many, many years ago, uh, when I was a senior in high school, I was in government class, and our government teacher, um, it was a 2007, there was a major presidential election going on. McCain, Palin versus Obama, Biden. You all remember it. And I was a senior, and everybody in our class, it was a senior class, and we had all just registered to vote. That was part of the government class. Good teaching from a great teacher, Joel Lofman was his name, a, one of my favorite teachers. Very animated, very entertaining, very good teacher. He knew how to get it through to you, but one of the uh, projects he laid forward after he had, he, you know, had us all register to vote. Good move on his part. Get us all involved in that. That's back when voting was still trustworthy, I believe. Obama did win that election. He won it big. He was very, very popular. As a former vice president, as much as I love him and pray for him, can't say the same for him when he ran for president. <laughs> but uh, I, I pray for the man. But man, he lost big. He lost about as big as by, or as Obama used to win. But um, one of the projects he gave us there was it was about heading into we just passed the primaries, I believe, heading into uh, maybe. I don't know. Going in, going into that president election, a couple months before, I don't know when exactly when, but he assigned us a project, and the project was that you were to cover one of those two major presidential candidates and give a presentation of a class of what they stood for, what they promised to do, the fundamentals of their platform, all that, etc. And you were assigned a candidate. You didn't pick one. You were assigned one. Me and my partner, we were assigned partners. We we were assigned John McCain, Sarah Palin. So. In the project, you could pick to either make a cardboard, poster board presentation and get in front of the class and point out some points on poster board, talk about it. Or you could make a video that he would play over the, the television in the classroom later on the date of your presentation. We decided to make a video. And to that point, I can't remember ever having made videos before. But we decided to make a video. And we, we went on, we, we got our ideas, we learned what they stood for, and we creatively implemented that into a video. And I still have the video today. But um, besides a, a, a project that we got a pretty good grade on, besides that, I came out of that experience with a passion for video editing. And I picked up a new hobby, and, and <clears throat> I realized it was something that I was good at. And I'm not saying that boastfully, it's just... God's good in everything. I'm nothing. But I just, I naturally was able to, to see things when, when I was doing working on that project. And it was something I never knew I could do before. And um, I just knew where things went and how to organize it without ever having been taught on how to video edit or audio edit. And I, I began to, I just knew what to do. It was strange, but it was God. It was God's help. But I came out of that learning with a passion for video editing. And I would go on and <laughs> I remember one of my friends, I would go on and start making videos of, uh, of athletes, of soccer players. Several of them I never published on YouTube. I made a video of Michael Jordan. I made videos of Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo made a video of David Beckham. Made videos of LeBron James. Some of those are on my YouTube channel now, but some of them I never published. But I used to put them on a PSP. I used to have this PSP. I remember this. And I would take him to school and make one of my friends watch him. He was a big Cristiano Ronaldo fan, as I was. And I made uh, videos of Ronaldo and all those guys. My friend would watch him and he'd tell me how they were. But I learned, or I picked up a new hobby and a new passion. And I, I figured out that that was something that God had blessed me with to be decent at. I'm not that good considering other people, but I could do it. 
naturally. And it was a gift I'd never been taught, but I could do it. And I went on to make audio. I, I went on to edit audio. We ended up making rap songs. I edited the audio. We made videos, countless videos, many of which never I never published on YouTube. Many of which I published on YouTube under other names. And many of which are on this channel, my YouTube channel, if this is where you're watching this. But coming out of that, um, one of the individuals, one of the faculty at uh, one of the staff at Alexander High School, who so happened to be the high, high school football coach, heard that I did video editing. His name was Sean Arno, a brilliant coach, probably the greatest coach in Alexander history, in the history of that high school. But uh, he had just attended us. I believe it was a coaching conference at the University of Cincinnati. And in that conference, they had exposed those coaches to their game day ritual. And part of what they showed them was how they would play a hype film for their players before they would go out and play a hype video. And they didn't really instruct the coaches to do that. But Coach Arno came back home from that. <clears throat> and I remember him getting a hold of me. I, I believe he called me. He got my number somehow, maybe from my brother, who was on the team at that time. And this was in 2009, I think. And Coach Arnold got a hold of me and he said, Hey, I just, I got back from University of Cincinnati. He said, One of the things they had there were they play hype films before their home games for the players to go out. And he said, What I want to do is I'm going to try to do that for our guys. <clears throat> and I want to know if you're interested in maybe coming out, taking some film, and, and putting something together for game day, for home games to get the guys excited and get them motivated and, and give them something to look forward to. So he called me, we set that up, and we started making hype films for the home games. And a brilliant idea on his part. Very, very uh, creative. And to my knowledge, he was one of the first coaches who did that. Um, nobody else that I knew of, not even on the Internet, and I'm probably wrong because it's a big country and football is a very popular sport. A lot of people video do video work, but... To my knowledge, he was one of the first who had that going on. Me and him were some of the first to do that. And I haven't talked to him in years, but I love the guy and pray for him. But brilliant idea on his part. And we went on to make several, several uh, videos, many of which I didn't put on YouTube. But And they, they were tremendously successful. The athletes loved him. But in that process, just as that coach reached out to me, and I, I used that gift of God, that natural gift, to make videos the Spirit of God came to me in a similar fashion just as that coach came to me coach Arno and God essentially said <laughs> gave me almost a, the same exact presentation I can't quote him I can't say he spoke to me audibly it was not audible but it came into my heart God spoke to me and I knew that he wanted me to use that gift for him and I had uploaded some Christian videos to my YouTube channel but I hadn't used my gift for God. It was no editing really involved in that stuff. It was just sermon, a few sermon clips and then a few random songs I found and some of the songs got deleted from my channel but a few songs I found I just uploaded them to try to honor God because that, that's after I gave God my whole life after an injury I went through. But I hadn't exactly used that gift of video editing for Him. But the Spirit of God came to me with an idea I had never thought of just like Coach Arno. And it was His idea. And he said, essentially to my spirit, this is not a verbal quote because I didn't hear him audible, but it came into me to where I knew what I want, he wanted me to do. And he said, I want you to take preaching sermons of, from various preachers, combine clips of them to, to make one video with one message set to a certain song. And the way we made those hype films was we would have, basically, I would... Harvest motivational speech, whether it's from Eric Thomas, Tim Tebow, whoever. Motivational <clears throat> sound bites set to music, motivational audio, and then set to to video of them playing. And it was essentially the same idea on God's part, but this time for the kingdom of heaven. And I took, God told me to take certain select audio clips of preachers preaching. Various preachers combine them as one with one message. No doubt there is a message in there about the unity of the body of Christ, but 
what God was trying to get me to do was to take this gift that He gave me that I did nothing for to use it for Him because that's why He gave it to me. And I'm not saying I'm the best. I am not. There's people out there who are so much better than me at the video editing, but whatever little good I am at it, it was God. But I went on. The first video I believe I made was Preach the Word. God put that in my heart. Preach the Word. Preach the cross. Preach redemption to a lost and dying world. And I took clips of different preachers from around the world. And the Spirit of God oversaw the process. I mean, I've never experienced anything like it. He would tell me what clip to get, where to put it, and how to put it there. I didn't do it. He directed it. He produced it. I edited it with His direction. And He said, get this clip, get this clip. And he actually, I made that video two or three times, I think, until I knew He, he was happy with it. Preach the Word. Make one video, one message. Many preachers probably calling the body of Christ together. Preach the Word. Preach the cross. Preach redemption to a lost and dying world. Lift your voice unashamed of the gospel of His name. Until all have heard, preach the Word. Preach the Word. The Spirit of God, the first video He had me make in that style was preach the Word. Preach the Word. And I took videos of other preachers, preachers around the world combined it. And you can see it on this channel. To, to send one message to preachers. Preach the word. Stop preaching prosperity. Stop trying to impress your audience. Stop trying to impress man. Stop trying to get wealthy in the name of God. Preach the word. Preach the cross. Preach redemption to a lost and dying world. Paul said, I have delivered unto you the whole counsel of God. I am clean of the blood of all men. Preachers are more bloody handed than any pedophile or abortionist in this world. Because they have the word of life. They have the word of life and they won't give it. And God said, if you warn them not, their blood I will require at your hand. And that's essentially what he was having me to do when I made that video. I mean, it didn't go out to the world as far as I know. It may have if it's featured on whatever else is going on. But it was clear. Preach the word. And the video opens with Gabriel Swaggart saying, We preach Christ. We preach Christ crucified. Paul told Timothy, preach the word. God said, you tell them, preach the word, and show them by preachers preaching the word. <laughs> Lift your voice unashamed. A few months after that, my friend Tyler Gillette came to see me, and he came to see me in the evening. He had, a, he had been in class that day. He was going to Hawking College. I don't remember what his major was, but he came to see me. And he said he had something to talk to me about. And he came up. This is when I lived in the apartment next to my mother's house. But he came to see me and he said, Lodge, I got to talk to you about something. And he called me Lodge. He said, Lodge, I was sitting in class. And he said, I kept hearing these words in my head. He was like, I never, I've never heard them before. I don't know where they came from. And obviously I was like, okay, what was it? What did you hear? And he said, I was sitting there, and he said it was math class, and he never really paid attention in math class. Somehow he still passed. But he said, I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, he said, I was just looking at my paper, and he said, these words came to my mind. And he said, they wouldn't stop. And he said, the words were, I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. And he said it just kept going. He said it wouldn't stop. It wouldn't stop. Even on, his, on the way over to see me, he said it wouldn't stop. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. And I didn't know. I'd never heard that before in my life. But we looked it up. We went to Google. You know, these are the days of no encyclopedia. He told me that. I felt the Spirit of God. 
And he ended up passing away a few years after them. That was right around the time where he really committed his life to God. And more than anything else, personally to him, that was God reaching out to him. But as far as it concerned me, and he said he felt like God wanted him to share that with me. As far as it concerned me, I didn't know what it meant. I didn't even know where those words came from. So we went to Google. I didn't recognize them from the, the Bible other than the biblical terminology. We went to Google. I Googled it up. And it was a song written by a man named Stuart Townend called How Deep the Father's Love for Us. I will not boast in anything. Those are words from that song. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. I looked it up and we found out where it was from and it, it touched his heart. He said, God's been speaking to me. God has been speaking to me. And I said, brother, God's speaking to me too. And I went to God and I said, what do you want? What is this? What are you saying? And God said, it. here it is. <laughs> I'm not quoting him audibly. He didn't speak to me audibly. But he put it in my heart. He said, we got another project. How deep the Father's love for us. And he said, I want, to, I want you to, to put together in the same format a message about how much I love sinners and include in that message the truth of the gospel what a powerful song and if you've seen that video what a powerful video and that was designed by God designed by God I was privileged to be used of him to be part of that process but once again when I surrendered my gifts to God God took it, God blessed it, and God multiplied it. And who knows, but maybe some souls have been won through that video. I don't know. Who knows? But maybe they have. I pray they have. Either way, many have seen and heard. Adrian Rogers says in that video, and this is what God wanted to get across. Adrian Rogers quotes in that video, as the Lord had me include. He says, all Christianity is summed up in these words. I deserve hell. Jesus took my hell. Now there's left, nothing left for me but His heaven. That's it. How deep the Father's love for us. I will not boast in anything. And the theme of that video is you can't earn it. It's a gift of God. The unmerited favor of God poured out on him and the grace of God poured out on man for God so loved the world that he gave his only that John 3 16 is the theme of that video and God has put that on display it didn't just end there God put that on display for many to see the view count may not be too high on that video but the, the signification of it was whether or not they believe, that's not my part. I did my part. I will not boast in anything. God wants the world to hear that. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. But again, that amazing experience, just Him speaking to my friend, God applied it to that gift. What a, and that, that wasn't, I, I made many, many videos like that. I don't know how many, a handful of them. I wouldn't say many, many, but a handful. Went on to make a video about the blood of Jesus under a divine inspiration, the same thing. Made a video about Mount Moriah, Abraham and Isaac. Made a video about the return of Jesus. Made a video about the deity of Jesus and how his resurrection proves it. Made another video about the love of God. All those came from God. They came from a man who surrendered a humble gift he had to the Lord, to God Almighty. And the point is, Noah seemed like he had little, and it would have cost him so much if he gave it to God, but he gave it to God, and look where it is now. The elephants are still here. I have a few pets myself. Man is still here. 
and how vast is the population of, of all things. There's no chance of overpopulation. This world is big. The population proves the faithfulness of God and the power of God to multiply and bless. Not only is the earth blessed when we commit it to God, we are blessed and we accomplish something of eternal significance that spans time and generation. Look where we are because of what Noah did. That's the same for everybody, all the patriarchs, all the prophets, and Christ most of all, and the apostles. They gave what God gave them back to God. The animals in my ark, whether even though it was just an insignificant video editing gift for this illustration, I hope I have other gifts I'm giving to them. I'm trying to give them everything. But the animals I had on my ark, I could keep it for my own and say, Lord, I can't commit that to you. What will somebody think if they see that? It may cost me something. It might, might cost me what I want. You've given it to me. This earth is mine. But I gave it to God and look what He did. And look what He'll do for you if you submit your gifts to Him. Surrender bodies to Christ as a living sacrifice. One of the things I learned from that passage of Scripture, not only that the earth will remain, not only that global warming is a lie created to control individuals and strip liberty, but that you and I the path to eternal significance is sacrifice and surrender. You can hoard up what you have and what you call yours and what looks like you'll lose if you give it to God. You can hoard it up for yourself or you can put it on an altar. The world in Noah's day was building what they wanted. In the days of Noah, they were eating, drinking, and giving in marriage. They were doing what they wanted. But there was a man named Noah who built an ark by the word of the Lord. He used his gifts, perhaps in carpentry. And he built an ark to God. And then the Bible says he built an altar unto the Lord. The only time I see Noah getting in trouble is when he planted a vineyard. God probably didn't tell him to do that. But what he built unto God, what eternal significance... The world of that day that did what they wanted to do, made their own thing out of it all, perished in a flood. Everything I do with whatever gifts God given, has given to me will be forgotten but for that which I do for God. The earth and all therein will be burnt by fire. The next time God does away with it, it will be by fire. And our works will be tried by fire. That which comes out and endures the fire will be that which was created and given to God sacrifice to God it is a sacrifice to give to God it does seem costly and it does cost something but the return is eternal glory as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man these days we live in people are taking their bodies and their gifts and making what they want out of them even their own gender as insane as that is This is my earth. That's what they're saying. This is my body. I'll do what I want with it. That's not what... That is the way to death and destruction and extinction. You change your gender, you deny your gender. You're not only not going to procreate, because you cut off... I mean, if you go that far, some people don't. Thank God they don't. God can fix you if you did and heal you and restore you. But if you do go so far you will go extinct, so to speak, figuratively speaking, according to the Scripture. If Noah doesn't sacrifice those animals to God, what well, doesn't seem to make sense, you don't probably don't see them today like you do. But because He honored God, without shedding of blood is no remission. He survived the storm by the mercy of God, but that doesn't mean He's a good man. He still needs a sacrifice. Don't make what you want out of it. Give it to God. Give it back to God. Give it to God. God loves you. God died for you. God gave His Son for you. 
I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. That's the sacrifice. That's the sacrifice. That is the sacrifice. Everything we give has to be tied to that. God was pleased with Noah because God was pleased with His Son. Christ is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. All these things pointed to the cross, and that's why it pleased God. Hook into the cross. God loves you. Boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Glory in the cross. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God. God has a plan for you. Don't make what you want out of it. It'll go, you'll go extinct. Don't don't lean on your own understanding. You don't know the future. God has provided the, for the sacrifice. The sacrifice is your way to blessing. God has made room on the ark for the sacrifice. God has put it in the womb of the figurative mother for the sacrifice, the literal mother, as many instances. Give it to God. Give it to God. God loves you. The sacrifice is the way to blessing. God help us to give this earth back to God. We need to do that. We're not going to save it. We can advance in technology to the point where we can do so much that brings awe and inspiration, but we can't do anything about it. This is God's earth. The way it's blessed is when we give it back to God. We want God to bless this nation. We'll give it back to Him. I love you. God loves you. Give all to Jesus Christ.